Okay, because I'm gonna go through one by one and talk about the different foods that have been connected to cancer. And we're gonna start with the weakest connection and work our way up to stronger and stronger connections. Hi, my name is Ryan Quinton. I'm a doctor, I'm a scientist. Some might even call me a doc scientist. I mean, no one has ever called me that, but you could. Anyways, we gotta get right into it. Today we're talking about a pretty controversial, exciting topic, okay? We're talking about diet and cancer. It seems like every week in the news, there's some new story about some food that might cause cancer. I think that I have a kind of unique perspective on this, okay? Because I'm a scientist, I have a PhD in cancer biology, so I really understand the process of cancer at a cellular level. At the same time, I'm also a doctor, so I also have a pretty good understanding of disease processes, and I'm gonna try to combine all of my training to try to answer this question, what foods cause cancer. Okay, so strap in because this is about to get exciting. Make sure to watch this video all the way to the end, okay? Because I'm gonna go through one by one and talk about the different foods that have been connected to cancer. And we're gonna start with the weakest connection and work our way up to stronger and stronger connections. I often will see claims like this when people talking about they've found something that causes cancer and it will be based on one study done in a laboratory showing that some compound in that food was shown in a lab to cause mutations in DNA. I will let you in on a kind of inconvenient little secret. Everything causes mutations. You think plants are good for you? Almost every plant has some naturally occurring compound in it that causes mutations in our DNA. Pepper causes mutations. Oranges, mutations. Soybean, mutation. Cantaloupe, apples, mutations. Coffee, bananas, cabbage, all mutations. What about pesticides? This is a great one. There's a whole industry built around organic fruits and vegetables, which I'll tell you makes no sense. All fruits and vegetables are organic. They're made of organic matter. But anyways, guess what? Pesticides cause mutations. Turns out all of the plants that we eat have evolved across millions of years, and they've been in a constant battle with bugs their whole existence, all right? And you know what they've done? They all create their own natural pesticides that kill the bugs that try to eat them. The natural pesticides that they produce cause mutations. You think that's bad? What about oxygen? You think that's air you're breathing now? The air that we breathe, we breathe in oxygen, it causes mutations. So often this happens in the news where some lab study has shown something in some food product causes mutations. And now this knowledge you have should let you be a little skeptical if that's the only evidence that is brought forth because virtually everything causes mutations. So you may be asking, how do we find out if something actually causes cancer or not? I'll tell you, it's pretty hard to figure out. First thing you wanna do is you wanna look at populations, right? You can do some population-based studies and you look to see in people that are getting cancer and people that are not getting cancer, try to find if there are some differences in maybe their diet or foods they're eating. And you find that people that ate a certain food tended to get this certain cancer more often. Does that mean that then you have figured out that this food causes cancer? No. Then what you have to do is go to a different population, preferably in a different country, all right? And in that different country, you look for that same thing. Do people eating that same food get that same type of cancer? If they do, now we're starting to be onto something. Now maybe there's a signal we're picking up and so you need to repeat that study in a different population, preferably in a different country. And so then, if these studies are all starting to agree and in all of these places, you're seeing this association, then you can start to suspect that maybe this is a little more than correlation. Maybe this thing is the causative factor, but you're not done. Okay, then what you need to do is you need to go into the laboratory. And in the laboratory, you need to figure out what are the compounds in this food. Figure out are any of these compounds capable of causing mutations in DNA. If you can find that, and then you set up two groups, a control group and experimental group of mice. And in the experimental group of mice, you feed them food that has that compound added to it. And then in the control group of mice, you give them all the exact same food, it's just missing that one compound. And then you see, is there a difference in cancer rates between these two groups of mice? And then you give increasing doses of that thing and see, is there a dose-related response with higher doses of that thing? Do you see more cancer? And then, if you've done all of that, we can conclude with pretty good confidence that this food does 
cause cancer. What are the foods that people are saying cause cancer these days? A really common one is food dye. When you're trying to answer these questions, it's much better to start at the human level. Do we see something in humans and then go backwards in the lab to try and see if you can figure out why? If you just start in the laboratory and say, look, in a laboratory, this thing caused cancer, the chance that that's gonna actually transfer over to human beings is extremely low. There have been some laboratory studies that show that they can cause cancer in some animals, but nothing has ever been shown in humans. There have been no population studies that show increased cancer rates in people that use food dyes compared to the people that don't. The next one I found, genetically modified organisms, GMOs, okay? And I didn't even wanna bring this one up because it just makes me upset. People think that somehow these GMOs can cause cancer. There has never been any study, any evidence ever in any lab study or in any population study that shows that GMOs cause cancer. I mean, it doesn't, it just makes no sense. All of the fruits and vegetables we eat are genetically modified. Anything that you're eating that you think is natural um, was domesticated over thousands of years, okay, with humans just geniuses figuring stuff out, figured out that they could cross different plants together and then create new plants, right? That's genetic modification. And what they did is they looked for traits in certain plants that they wanted to mix with other plants, and they mixed their genes together by breeding the plants together, and that's how we have all of the fruits and vegetables we eat today. You wanna to know what genetically modified plants have done? All right, there's this guy, Norman Borlaug, who was a geneticist and he figured out how to genetically modify wheat to increase its yield and allow it to grow in more dry environments where it couldn't grow before. And because of that, he saved about a billion people from starving to death, okay? If you see a genetically modified plant, you should every, just pay your respects every time you walk by that and say, wow, what an amazing thing. And then buy it and eat it and rest assured that it is not going to cause cancer. Potatoes. Now this is an interesting one. If you take potatoes and you cook them in a certain way, you kind of heat them up in a certain way, like when you make french fries or potato chips, turns out a compound is uh, produced called acrylamide. We haven't really found a difference in cancer rates that we can attribute to acrylamide. So, so far we're really striking out here on some of the big ones, okay? Food dyes, GMOs, potatoes. What is the next one? Fluoride. Now this is actually pretty easy to answer because people started fluoridating water in about the 50s. And it didn't all happen at once, right? Different cities did it at different times, different states started doing it at different times. And so what we have is all of these natural experiments being done where we can easily compare and say, okay, well this city over here started fluoridating their water and this one didn't. What happened to cancer rates across there? Oh, it turns out no difference at all. People have studied this so thoroughly and never found any connection between the fluoride in our tap water and differences in cancer rates in human beings. Okay, next one, this is a good one, okay? A lot of people talking about artificial sweeteners. These are things like aspartame, sucralose, stevia. People have done population studies and haven't really found much of a difference in cancer rates. There was one study though, and they did find an increase in cancer rates associated with not all artificial sweeteners, but one in particular aspartame. On average, across the population they looked, increased the prevalence of certain cancers by a factor of 1.1, meaning that if you have in your life, say, a 1% chance of getting a certain cancer, your risk then goes from 1% to 1.1%. ,1 so this is a risk, it's a real result that they found, but this is a very small increase in risk. Um, and then the fact that all of these other studies have shown no connection, if there is a connection, the risk, the increased risk from artificial sweeteners is extremely small. Okay, the next food I wanna talk about is salt. Salt is delicious. The average American eats somewhere around like three, three and a half grams of salt a day. In a lot of Asian countries, the average salt intake is, you know, somewhere around like 10, 11, 12 grams per day, much higher. And there is evidence that there's an association between these high levels of salt intake and a specific type of cancer called gastric cancer. Gastric cancer is very common 
in a lot of Asian countries, not very common in the United States. There is this correlation with a really high salt diet and gastric cancer. How much? Well, in the United States, your lifetime risk of getting gastric cancer is around 0.8%. And if you eat a really, really high salt diet, you know, much higher than the average American diet, your lifetime risk goes from 0.8% to 0.88%. next one is actually a really good one, meat. We're talking about red meat, beef, pork, lamb, goat. And when they compare people who are what they call, you know, high levels of meat, you're eating more than three and a half ounces a day, and compare that to those who are eating little or no meat, they found an increased risk for colorectal cancer. In the United States, your lifetime risk of getting colorectal cancer is around 4.1%. Now, if you eat more than three and a half ounces of meat per day across your lifetime, that will increase your lifetime risk to about 4.8% processed meat. These are things like ham, bacon, sausage, pepperoni. These carry a similar risk. Your baseline risk of colorectal cancer, which we said is 4.1%, it will also increase it to about 4.8%. If you're eating a diet that's high in red meats and processed meats, you know, you could easily push your lifetime risk of colorectal cancer up from, you know, around 4% to, you know, above 5%. Even though, again, the difference is relatively mild, it's still there. And we have good data across many different populations showing the same result, as well as laboratory studies showing a similar result. So with pretty good confidence, we can say that red meats and processed meats increase your risk specifically for colorectal cancer. If there was one thing in your diet that you wanted to limit to reduce your risk of cancer, it should be this one, okay? And I'm talking about alcohol. We talk about moderate drinking, and what moderate drinking means is roughly one drink a day for women and two drinks a day for men. Many of the studies compare moderate drinkers to those that drink less than that or none at all. Alcohol tends to cause cancer in the parts of your body that it interacts with. So drinking alcohol causes an increase in head and neck cancer rate. These are cancers that can happen in your mouth and larynx. Your lifetime risk of getting uh, head and neck cancer is somewhere around 1.2%. And if you are a moderate drinker, that risk goes up to 2.3%. The next thing alcohol hits on its way down is your esophagus. Your lifetime risk of getting esophageal cancer is about 0.5%. Moderate drinkers goes up to about 0.65%. Alcohol is metabolized by your liver. Your lifetime risk of getting liver cancer is about 1.2%. Moderate drinkers goes up to about 2.2%. For women in the United States, lifetime risk of breast cancer is pretty high. It's around 12.9%. For moderate drinkers, it goes up to 15.5%. Lifetime risk of colorectal cancer uh, is around 4.1%. Moderate drinking goes up to 5.5%. Okay, the final one. This is the big one, sugar. I'm talking about that white, refined, delicious little minx. A lot of people seem to be under the impression that if you eat sugar, it feeds cancer cells. This is sort of true. They do use sugar more than normal cells, um, but the reality is, is that all cells need sugar to live. It's not like if you don't eat sugar, your blood sugar levels go down to zero and you can like starve the cancer cells of the sugar that they need. If your blood sugar goes down to zero, you will have a seizure and die. If you don't take in sugar, your body will just metabolize other things and maintain a normal blood sugar level. So you can't starve cancer cells from sugar. That is nonsensical. So there has been no direct link shown between sugar and cancer, but there is a very important indirect link. You know, if over a long period of time you eat high amounts of sugar, you tend to gain weight. And once people go from healthy weight to overweight and then enter into the obese category, there starts to be a pretty significant increase in your risk for some cancers. And the first one, and this is the largest one, is in women and endometrial cancer, okay? So your lifetime risk of endometrial cancer as a woman is about 2.8%. 
And if you're obese, that risk goes up to 8.4%. Okay, so that's a significant increase. Again with women, your lifetime risk of breast cancer is about 12.9%. If you're premenopausal and obese, actually your risk for breast cancer goes down slightly. Um, but if you're postmenopausal, your risk of breast cancer goes up from 12.9% to 15.4%. Esophageal cancer, your lifetime risk is about 0.5%. With obesity, it goes up to 1.2%. Gastric cancer, lifetime risk is 0.8%. If you're obese, it goes up to 1.6%. Liver cancer, your lifetime risk is about 1.1%. And if you're obese, it goes up to 2.2%. Kidney cancer, your lifetime risk of kidney cancer is about 1.8%. If you're obese, it goes up to 3.6%. Pancreatic cancer, very deadly cancer. Lifetime risk of pancreatic cancer, 1.7%. With obesity, 2.6%. And finally, colorectal cancer. Lifetime risk of colorectal cancer is about 4.1%, with obesity goes up to 5.3%. And this is kind of the crux of this whole video, okay? This is what I'm trying to say. You should not worry so much about individual foods, some individual food that is supposedly causing cancer. As we've gone through the list, we've talked about some of them. Food dyes, no. Potatoes, also no. GMOs, definitely no. Fluoride and water, also no. Artificial sweeteners, maybe a little bit. Meat, yes. Red meats, processed meat, small increase in risk. Salt, if you eat a ton, a ton of salt can, you know, slightly increase your risk. Alcohol, definitely. Now the strongest link we have is between alcohol and cancer risk and obesity and cancer risk. So you should eat a healthy diet. Dietary choices, you know, the food we eat has a large impact on our health. But in terms of cancer, you know, the connection between diet and cancer is relatively weak. So that's it. And in my next video, I'm going to talk about the foods that can prevent cancer. So make sure you're subscribed so you can tune into that. All right.